Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I'm not used to having to speak over a crowd of people <laughs> anymore. anymore. Um, my name is Randy Papadopoulos. Um, a couple of administrative announcements. First of all, for virtual participants, we ask that you please mute your microphone uh, and please do not use the chat function except to pose questions. Uh, remind, uh, I remind everyone in the room, please, to speak clearly through your mask. I'm struggling to do that right now. We're all in the same boat. So, uh, but given the crowd in this room, I don't want to set up a super spreader event. So please, um, to the extent that you're comfortable, uh, please uh, keep the, keep your mask on. Um, panelists are able to remove their masks unless anyone has any serious objections. Uh, panelists will be able to remove their masks, but only when they're speaking. Uh, finally, um, all virtual questions are, we request that you hold them to the end. We'll try to address them at that time and work through them as we go. Um, you may notice that there are fewer of us than on stage than the program specifies. Our chair, Frank, Dr. Frank Hoffman, was unfortunately called away for a senior briefing and was unable to join us today, so we are lacking him. This has forced us to adapt, improvise, and overcome, as that great military expression goes and come up with uh, a way. So we're gonna introduce each other in a round robin sort of way, where Dr. Callahan will introduce Dr. Blazic, Dr. Blazic will introduce me, I will introduce Mr. Hone, and Mr. Hone will introduce Dr. Callahan. Um, if that doesn't confuse you, nothing else on this session will. Um, on a very personal note, let me say how blasted fortunate we are to be in this room this way. I think we're very lucky. Yeah. With that, please introduce Dr. Blasich. Oh, the panel title. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the U.S. Navy's torpedoes, Beer Ordnance, and Pacific Command in World War II. Um, Dr. Blasich, do you read me? We have good comms. <laughs> um. oh, Frank Blasich is a curator of history, history at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. He's the author of. Relating to modern American military history, kitchens to pontoons, prisoners of war, and naval planners. His work has appeared in the Journal of Military History, Naval War College Review, the Northern Mariner, on Army History, Naval History, Air Power History, Marine Corps History, you get them all, War on the Rock, Center, not Space Force. Space Force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. online and the Washington Post. In his free time, he is the regional coordinator for the Society for Military History and the National Historian of the Civil Air Patrol. Are you good, Frank? Thank you very much, Dr. Callahan. I think we're good to go. Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Somehow with the Google, I have to change to a different window for my slides and I lose the audio feedback for some reason. So fasten your seat belts and hold on. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to the global pandemic, I was unable to access much of the primary archival sources I desired to use. This presentation will therefore be part curatorial talk and part an exercise in squeezing intellectual blood from secondary source stones. In 1915, American engineer Alan A. Canton claimed to have perfected a self-propelled torpedo guided by magnetism, able to defeat the latest incarnation of the all-powerful warship, the Dreadnought. Canton reported his torpedo had 100% accuracy and could dive deep to strike the unarmored portion of a warship's hull. 
The secret of his weapon involved the use of electromagnetism to detect the presence of any great mass of metal to help guide the torpedo to its target. Suffice to say, Canton's torpedo did not materialize, but his interest in harnessing magnetism to an underwater weapon to detect and destroy warships would become reality in the interwar period where the U.S. Navy's Bureau of Ordnance's development of the Mark VI torpedo exploder. The development of, of the Mark VI merged evolutionary knowledge and design of torpedo contact exploders with revolutionary magnetic influence technology, incorporating the latest electromechanical inventions. This talk will examine, will detail the origin and development of the Mark VI exploder in the interwar period through the examination of the physical object itself, forgotten for decades in the collections of the Smithsonian Institution. Now, beginning with the design, development, and testing of the first self-propelled torpedo by Robert Whitehead in the late 1860s, all torpedoes entering service in World War I detonated their explosive charge via physical contact with the hull of a vessel, an action involving the use of a unique exploder device. Now, the first American torpedo exploder is found in the Mark I HAL torpedo, developed by Captain John A. HAL in the 1880s. To detonate the weapon's explosive charge of 99 pounds of wet gun cotton, HAL devised a, quote, war nose, which screwed into the front of the warhead. This featured a safety mechanism in the form of a small reverse pitch screw fan to render the torpedo safe until fired. Once launched, the fan would slowly unwind from the body of the torpedo forward until it completely unthreaded itself about 30 to 40 yards from the point of release. When the torpedo impacted the hull, a conical point affixed to a central sleeve would be pushed inward, severing a lead shearing pin before compressing a firing spring, which tripped a sear spring to release a central firing pin, which, released from spring tension, would impact a percussion cap to detonate a booster charge of fulminated mercury primed with dry long staple gun cotton to then detonate the main warhead. Now, the EW Bliss Company also licensed manufactured 3.55 meter by 45 centimeter Whitehead Mark I torpedoes for the U.S. Navy. Now, Whitehead torpedo warheads used the, the War Nose Mark I, which, like the HAL, screwed into the front of the warhead. The War Nose Mark I functioned similarly to the HAL arming itself about 70 yards after about 70 yards of travel. And like the HAL, the exploder would only work at a 90 degree angle with the warhead and the target aligned on a longitudinal axis. Now, Whitehead and E.W. Bliss subsequently developed war noses for oblique or glancing impacts. Whitehead's war nose Mark II featured four levers, beamed whiskers, that extended outward from the central screw fan along the cardinal points of the warhead. Should the torpedo strike a glancing blow on a target, one of the outward levers would trigger the release of a firing pin and the detonation of the booster charge of the warhead. Frank M. Leavitt, an engineer of E.W. Bliss, designed and patented an American war nose for direct and oblique impacts that blended aspects of the HAL and the Whitehead designs with added safety measures. These would prevent premature detonation or arming of the weapon until a considerable distance from the firing vessel. Now, in 1912, the U.S. Navy began work on what became the 21-inch Bliss Leavitt Mark 8 torpedo. This larger torpedo carried a warhead of 321, and later 175 pounds of TNT, at 27 knots at a range of 10,000 to 15,000 yards, intended as a long-range anti-surface ship weapon for the Navy's fleet destroyers. <laughs> Accompanying the torpedo was the new Mark III exploder seen here. Designed and developed by the Naval Torpedo Station, Newport, Rhode Island, the Mark III fit flush into the underside of the warhead, forward of the transverse center line near the center of a long explosive charge. This changed the orientation of the exploder's firing mechanism from a parallel to a perpendicular orientation in relation to the torpedo's path of travel. The Mark III used a three-bladed impeller as the foundation for its safety mechanism. Once fired, the water spun the impeller, which drove a gear train to rotate an armor gear, which after 140 yards of travel, moved a detonator carrier out of a safety chamber and into the booster cavity in the warhead. This action further compressed the firing spring and unlocked the trigger mechanism. Now, the Mark III utilized Newton's first law of motion, the inertia principle. The impact of the torpedo against the target shifted a large inertia ball, displacing a smaller ball bearing, which released the trigger. This activated a spring, which pushed the firing pin body, holding a pair of short firing pins upwards into a percussion cap, activating fulminated mercury to trigger the booster charge of tetral, which detonated the warhead. The inertia impact system made the exploders extremely sensitive to contact. A blow of less than five pounds of force could trigger a detonation. The sensitivity negated the need for whiskers and enabled operation at any angle of impact. Now, actual live fire testing of the Mark III exploder in peacetime remains unclear. 
The first actual firing of one of these weapons occurred on 21 May 1917 when the destroyer Ericsson, only a week after arriving overseas with the 7th Destroyer Division, closed on the German submarine U-48 and fired a Mark 8 torpedo at a range of 7,000 yards, albeit without an effect. And by the armistice of 11 November 1918, only 10 additional torpedoes have been unleashed by the Navy, all against two boats. None found the side of an enemy's hull. And outside of laboratory testing, the Mark III exploder's performance in combat remained unknown, much less the combat performance of any American torpedo exploder to date. Harnessing the magnetic influence technology for a, tor for a torpedo exploder came in response to evolutions in warship design to defend against the weapons. Torpedo nets, seen here on the left, protected existing vessels, while newer warships incorporated additional armor plating and or external hull sections such as torpedo blisters or bulges to absorb the blast of the weapon and maintain the structural integrity of the hull. A torpedo detonated by an impact exploder against such defenses would cause damage, but likely not a singular killing blow. Now, magnetic influence offered a way to detonate a weapon without direct impact. A single torpedo detonated under the heel of a vessel by magnetic influence would avoid defenses and potentially destroy a warship. This offered a far more economical use of opportunity, torpedo mechanism, and explosive than mere than mere impact exploders could provide. Saw in a practical magnetic influence exploder a solution to the problem of torpedo supply. With the potential to develop a one-shot, one-kill torpedo, seemingly within technological reach, the Bureau chose to act. On June 1922, Newport launched Project G-53 under utmost secrecy to develop an exploder to use a ship's inherent magnetism to attract the torpedo or trigger the warhead's detonation. The research effort eventually zeroed in on detonation actuated by detecting perturbations in the Earth's magnetic field initiated by the presence of a single vessel. While knowledge of the Earth's magnetic fields had increased for centuries, Newport's project confronted considerable gaps in the knowledge of the perturbations beneath its keel and in the need to compensate for the variation in the Earth's magnetic field depending on a ship's position from the magnetic poles. In the winter of 1924, testing of a prototype exploder on a torpedo commenced, and Newport conducted two successful test firings with the developmental magnetic influence exploder using unarmed Mark 10 torpedoes which passed under a target submarine. Newport also fired a live fire test with a decommissioned battleship, but viewer denied the request, and they instead obtained a decommissioned submarine, L-8, to serve as a target. In Narragansett Bay on 8 May 1926, Newport personnel ready to Mark 10 torpedo with a live warhead containing a prototype magnetic influence exploder. The first torpedo ran too deep and passed under the hull without detonation, as you can see on the left. A second torpedo passed just beneath the submarine and detonated with spectacular results, seen on the right, sending L8 to the bottom. With obvious pleasure at a 50% success rate, Newport marked the option of the exploder for submarine torpedoes. And Bjork ordered the torpedo station to proceed with further development of the device for use on both surface ship and aircraft torpedoes. Now, the physical exploder and the science underpinning it required further bench development. Despite the apparent success of L-8 sinking, Newport's research department admitted all prior development was attempted, quote, with no proper foundation in knowledge of the magnetic field to be encountered under ships or of the current that might be induced thereby. So basically talking about magic. One possible development in 1928 for the prototype came about with the invention by General Electric and Electrical Engineer Albert, eh, Albert W. Hull of the Thiatron tube, which you can see on the left, a gas filled tube with a hot cathode, anode, and a control grid between the two elements. This tube could handle high currents and it functions like a controlled rectifier and or a high powered electrical switch. Now, two years later in 1930, the prototype magnetic influence exploder had advanced significantly enough to warrant greater field testing. To better understand magnetic fields, Newport and Ford arranged in the winter of 1930 for studies in southern latitudes with what was now referred to as the index mechanism. And this stands for magnetic induction and exploder. Several examples took part in field tests off Cologne, Panama, and additional Newport personnel took approximately 7,000 magnetic readings off of Cuba, on the magnetic equator, and off Rio de Janeiro. The new information on the magnetic fields moved Newport to further refine the mechanism's electrical system. And armed with the new knowledge and an improved design, 
Bjorg felt confident enough to purchase 30 index mechanisms from General Electric in 1991 at a unit cost, and this is July 2021 dollars, of approximately $17,391.32 each. So with physical production examples in hand, Newport suggested these to increase testing. Their researchers in the winter of 1932 and 1933 sent several other production models to the Caribbean and South America for testing aboard the destroyer Babbitt. The heavy cruiser Indianapolis served as a target vessel for 100 test shots along the equator or between 10 degrees north and south latitude. Positive test results convinced Newport that the magnetic influence detector could work in multiple latitudes. In the summers of 1932 and 33, Newport Orbital Engineer Chester T. Minkler filed patents for a, quote, magnetically controlled torpedo firing mechanism. See, one of them is seen here on the right. With Newport supremely confident in the exploder, the time was right for another live fire test. Newport intended for the next mechanism, specifically its magnetic influence element, to be used against heavy warships. And in 1932, the Bureau asked for a heavy cruiser to serve as a target. The following year, Admiral William H. Stanley, Chief of Naval Operations, and the Bureau of Construction Repair instead offered Muir the use of the destroyer Ericsson for live fire testing. How did the Bureau cover the cost to raise and repair the vessel should the live fire test perform as intended? Muir passed on the offer, and the Bureau of Ships subsequently sold the Navy's first vessel to fire a torpedo in combat for scrap in 1934. That's it. The index mechanism was officially designated as the Mark VI Exploder. Newport made one final addition prior to production, and that was adding an anti countermining device, which resulted in the Mark VI Modification I Exploder mechanism. Production of the Mark VI Mod 1 commenced at the Newport Torpedo Station. Working in isolation, the station's craftsmen handmade the various components of the device which were then assembled into complete exploders by a select group of personnel in the research department and tested to maintain secrecy about the device. Now, ostensibly to avoid foreign nations learning of its existence and potentially developing countermeasures, albeit at the expense of technical education for the U.S. Navy's torpedo men, Newport produced a separate exploder designated the Mark V. This utilized the same base plate as the Mark VI to fit in the Mark XIV torpedo's warhead. The Mark V, however, lacked any of the electrical elements essential for the magnetic influence device. And outside of Newport, perhaps only a handful of officials knew the existence of the Mark VI Mod 1 Exploder. In anticipation of the day the Mark VI would, could be revealed for the Navy, Newport published a confidential ordnance pamphlet for the upkeep and operation of the Mark VI Mod 1 Exploder. The pamphlet offered a general description of the mechanism and all necessary instructions for care and adjustment. But in a nod to the exploder's assembly process, the pamphlet cautioned, quote, there are fits between certain parts of the mechanism which militate against complete interchangeability of parts, even though the parts are within drawing tolerances. So in a nation, the firearms industry pioneered interchangeable parts, and the automobile industry assembly line production techniques, Newport's Mark VI proved more an object of art than an industrial weapon of war. Now, within the collections of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History is an original early production example of a Mark VI Mod 1 Exploder, serial number 2086. Within the Exploder shipping box is a form, seen here on the left, listing the device as having been assigned to the Atlantic Fleet destroyer Hillary P. Jones and being inspected and tested aboard the destroyer tender Prairie on 9 June 1941. Intriguingly, this is a fired example. Really a dud. Exactly what transpired either in testing or operational use for this exploder to be damaged and preserved remains unknown. The pandemic has the Smithsonian's archive closed, and I can't get it. We can have a discussion of its components and how these all interact. Fire assembly weighs approximately 90 pounds. Magnetic influence and inertia impact elements are mounted to a heavy bronze base plate substantially greater in size than the Mark III Exploder. Now, early in development, Newport found that bronze construction made possible to use a higher voltage in the operating circuit. The bronze base is a round plate covering the anti-countermining device. Now, adjacent for this is a channel in the base for seawater to flow through an interactive impeller of 50 convex blades. As the torpedo moves through the ocean, the impeller spins up a water wheel. The impeller connects to the direct current generator 
On this generator, developed by General Electric, has a double armature with two commutators to supply high and low voltage to energize the thiatron, the, the voltage control diode, a potential divider, and a solenoid. The low voltage, high current power flows to the thiatron, heating up the cathode out filament. The high voltage travels to the thiatron's grid element, anode plate, and the warmed cathode filament to ensure the correct voltages, particularly the biasing voltage critical to keep the thiatron from triggering. Now the opposite end of the shaft from the impeller to the generator terminates at a worm gear. This meshes with a gear on the vertical drive shaft, the middle of which has another worm gear to mesh with a delay switch control. The safety device in its closed position acts as a short circuit to prevent high voltage electricity from the generator flowing to the thiatron until the torpedo has traveled 450 yards from the point of firing. This consists of a worm and worm wheel, which only partially turns a set distance. Now during testing, engineers at Newport had learned that the rapid change in torpedo direction, which would typically be incidental to launching at high speed or in rough water, could actually trigger the thiatron inadvertently and fire the weapon. So therefore, after the delay switch opens, the arming screw of the delay device unlocks a firing pole linked to the solenoid lever system. The thiatron tube warms up and a booster charge of Tetral travels upward from a safety chamber into the booster cavity and the torpedo is thus fully armed. Now the main component of the magnetic influence device is mounted on the side of the base plate. To detect and measure the magnetic fields, researchers use essentially an induction magnetometer. The physical sensor which Newport employed, referred to here as the pickup coil, consists of a hundred thousands of turns of fine copper wire around a ferromagnetic tubular core inserted inside of a four inch diameter, 12 inch long copper can. Through the center of the can is passed a 34 inch long core rod made of perma alloy, a nickel iron magnetic alloy known for its property of extremely high magnetic permeability. The coil and the rod collectively then function in a passive mode to measure the changing magnetic flux intensity levels of the Earth's magnetic field. As the torpedo travels to its target, this pickup coil produces a small variable voltage outputs, which are increased by the core rod. When the assembly is in proximity to the hull of the ship, between five to 20 feet, the perturbations of the ship's magnetic field produce an electromagnetic field with increased voltage on the assembly. Two glass electrical tubes, a thiatron and a voltage regulator, sit on adjacent sides of the generator. The latter controls the voltage output of the generator regardless of the speed of the impeller, ensuring constant regulated voltage necessary for use in multi-speed torpedoes. The former, acting as an amplified electrically actuated switch, provides a switching action for when the pickup coil and the core rod sense a change in magnetic fields and an increased positive voltage. At a preset value, the increased positive voltage overcomes the negative voltage on the thiatron's grid, removing the bias holding back electrons on the cathode, which then flow to a solenoid immediately adjacent to the generator. When the solenoid receives energy from the activated switched thiatron, a spring cushion armature springs forward one quarter of an inch, actuating the pawl whose arm, attached arm engages a finger, which on contact pushes upward, dislodging the firing ring of the inertia impact exploder mechanism to detonate the warhead. Directly atop the generator sits the inertia impact exploder. This device is an evolution of the Mark III, which did not integrate with the magnetic influence device. The redesigned exploder by itself would become the Mark IV exploder used in the Mark 13 aircraft torpedo. And like the Mark III, the Mark VI's inertia impact exploder orients its firing pins perpendicular to the orientation of the torpedo's path of travel and it is sensitive to impact, requiring no more than 5.5 pounds of pressure to trigger the mechanism. In lieu of the inertia ball and scissors of the Mark III, the new iteration utilizes an inertia impact ring type assembly. As the torpedo speeds through the water, the impeller rotates the arming screw, which among other duties, compresses the arming screw and firing spring and unlocks the safety balls, firing pin guide and inertia firing assembly. Upon impact with the target, the shift in momentum moves the inertia ring, releasing a firing lever, which lifts the trigger plate and trigger cap. The cap will then slide upward three millimeters, releasing two firing balls into cuts in the cap body, which frees the spring-loaded firing pin guide, carrying two small pins to thrust upward along dual guide rods. The pins impinge on fulminated mercury caps, detonating the tetral and the booster charge, and then the warhead's explosive. This all occurs in a fraction of a second. Arguably, the Mark VI Mod 1's exploders, complexity, and limited exposure is where one should pause and wonder if it will work. Vice Admiral Charles Lockwood, Commander, Submarine Force Pacific Fleet, referred to the exploder as a, quote, Rube Goldberg device with good cause. Any of a number of complex mechanical or electrical systems, if improperly manufactured, assembled, or serviced, could fail and transform over 3,000 pounds of Mark 14 or Mark 15 torpedo 
into effectively an underwater shopping cart to scratch and dent the hulls of target vessels. To their credit, Newport and Buor made efforts to better understand the Earth's magnetic fields and tune the magnetic influence device to operate consistently in ideal conditions with test warheads. But the hard reality remained, however, that the finished exploder had never been used in a live fire test. And the magnetic detection device incorporated on an early prototype exploder prior to the added refinement of the thiatron tube only had a 50% success rate against the target submarine rather than a battleship or armored cruiser. The inertia impact device carried the totality of the design lineage of American torpedo exploders. Meticulous machining and detailed design produced an intricate ballet of screws, gears, and springs to ensure the torpedo would not detonate until a safe distance from the point of release. And when activated, the various parts all work collectively to move a pair of firing pins on a guide in a linear motion to convert mechanical into chemical energy to detonate the warhead. The Mark III, which formed the foundation for the Mark VI's inertia impact device, had no known torpedo detonations against enemy vessels. How the Mark VI inertia impact exploder would perform when paired with the new Mark 14 and Mark 15 torpedoes remained unknown. Ultimately then, the US Navy's submarine and surface forces went into battle with unproven torpedoes whose detonation depended on untested exploders. The laboratory of war would soon yield disturbing data. I thank you all for your time and attention, and I look forward to your questions. Frank, you gonna tell me? Oh, we can mute it. Oh yeah, sorry about that. That tells you where my brain is. It's on torpedo exploders. <laughs> Funny how that works, right? When you get in the groove. Okay. You and me both. So Sarandis Randy Papadopoulos received his BA from the University of Toronto, uh, MA in military and naval history from the University of Alabama, and a doctorate from George Washington University. At uh, George Washington University, his, dis his dissertation was entitled Feeding the Sharks, the Logistics of Submarine Warfare, 1935 to 1945. He has been a lecturer in history at GW University, George Washington University, Norwich University, and the University of Maryland College Park. He's worked at the United States Naval History and Heritage Command as the Secretary of Historian for the Department of the Navy and is currently a strategy analyst in the U.S. Navy Warfighting Development Directorate, OPNAV N7. His publications include articles, book reviews, service as principal co-author of the book Pentagon 9-11, published by the Historian Office of the Secretary of Defense, and co-editing Conceptualizing Maritime and Naval Strategy, a friendship for Captain Peter M. Schwartz. Randy holds the Department of the Navy's Superior and Distinguished Civilian Service Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Papadopoulos. I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> Well, you can get it right. Exactly so. <laughs> Obstinate or overwhelmed, understanding the Bureau of Ordnance in resolving Mark VI exploder problems. And please let me note that these are just my ideas, not those of anyone in the United States Navy, in the United States Department of Defense, or the United States government. The origins of this paper stem from earlier research, which unveiled apparent parallels between the United States Navy and German Kriegsmarine torpedo problems during the Second World War which seeks to get at the roots of the thinking inside the U.S. Navy Bureau of Ordnance as it confronted problems in the torpedoes it designed and had built, most notably the flawed performance of the Mark VI exploder. The problem cast here is one of logistics, in which a set of retail observations of technical difficulties could not be converted into wholesale solutions by the Bureau of Ordnance. Next slide, please. The most infamous case of malfunctioning U.S. Navy torpedoes took place on 10 July 1943 when the USS Tenosa, skippered by Lieutenant Commander Lawrence R. Daspit, seen here as a captain, disabled the large Imperial Japanese whaling ship Tonon Maru III off truck using two torpedoes. With the target stationary, Daspit and his crew could not miss, yet their full sequence of 15 Mark 14 torpedo shots, 10 of which actually hit the vessel, <laughs> failed to sink it. <laughs> Instead, the Tenosa returned home with one torpedo for analysis of its failures, while Japan repaired the Tonan Maru III, returning it to service before American aircraft sank it the next year. The remaining torpedo would be test fired under the supervision of Vice Admiral Charles Lockwood, Commander Submarine Pacific, who ordered tests leading to the ultimate fix of its Mark VI exploder shortcoming. For this, uh, for this audience, the foregoing is undoubtedly familiar, as the U.S. Navy's torpedo problems, next slide please, 
have appeared elsewhere, even as a central theme, in a 1951 John Wayne film, Operation Pacific. I love this because it says he could thread a torpedo through a needle and seal a date with a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Submarine crews and captains excoriated the U.S. Navy Bureau ordinance for ignoring the problem until wartime experience conveyed through frontline commander Lockwood made it obvious. I argue here the Bureau did not ignore these observations and concerns, but instead confronted production challenges, many dating from the pre-war era, which prevented a focus on solving the difficulties until the fleet made its nature clear. As Frank observed in his very, very fine paper, the Mark VI exploder, and by the way, we got a chance to view the uh, exploder in the National Museum of American History, and it is an amazing thing to do. Trent and Tom Hone and I got to do this. It is a wonderful thing to see, and Frank really made it available to us to, to inspect long before COVID. The Mark VI exploder was designed to solve two problems. Tactically, it would enable a subsurface torpedo explosion to bypass improvements in warship hull armor, as Frank observed. With such capability, torpedoes could bypass better protection designed to defeat the weapons, reducing the quantities of the weapons needed to sink targets and perhaps allowing one shot to sink one ship. The underbottom advantage was fragile, however, mandating its classification of secret. And secret is the highest classification level in the United States military until 1942. That measure was taken to prevent any steps to negate its function. But that security is going to make resolution of its faults harder. In addition, that last step meant sailors would not be familiar with the Mark VI exploder, which was stored ashore until the war opened for America. Equally important during peacetime years of low spending, greater deadliness would cut the number of weapons needed to sink targets. That element reflected Bureau of Ordnance res responsibility and concern, and this is recorded as early as 1922, throughout the next two decades, that it could not build torpedoes fast enough to meet fleet demand. In 1930, the Bureau argued it was easier and faster to build torpedo bombers rather than the loads they carried, and therefore advocated crafting four shots per Navy airplane. Remember, the torpedo bomber could carry one uh, torpedo at a time. Similarly, shortages persisted as an ongoing bureau concern throughout the 1930s as it sought to build two and a half torpedo loads for each submarine. These efforts proved inadequate as the Armament Office noted in 1939 that it could not build more than 1,000 torpedoes per year for a war which it posited would rise up, would use up 5,000 of them annually. Attempts to ramp up pre Pearl Harbor production did not fix the shortfall, and accelerating war, as accelerating warship production demanded even more weapons to equip new ships, beyond any which might be expended or lost in combat. The Bureau of Ordnance added staff rising from 1,000 personnel in 1933 to 3,000 in 1937, then 4,800 as it reopened its Alexandria, Virginia factory in 1940 to create greater capacity. Even using them, it could only build a total of 2,500 torpedoes of all types per year, or about half anticipated wartime need. Shortages of subcontracted parts partly created bottlenecks. Rather than trying to radically accelerate deliveries, the peacetime Navy turned to refurbishing existing stock of weapons, its existing stock of weapons, including those it regarded as obsolete, meaning it dispatched older Mark 10 torpedoes on submarines throughout World War II, although not often used in combat. After Pearl Harbor, demands for greater torpedo production intensified for the Bureau. The Asiatic fleet lost 249 Mark 14 torpedoes ashore, or 10 full loads for fleet boats during the fall of the Philippines. That loss added urgency to resolving the Bureau's production problems. Shortages of weapons so seriously affected, afflicted submariners offering from Western Australia that in late 1942, they sailed off Southeast Asia either with partial weapons loads or largely carrying mines. That five crews planting mines witnessed some of them, equipped with a different magnetic exploder, detonate harmlessly just after laying, probably further distracted Bureau of Ordnance attention. Efforts to create an electric torpedo, less visible due to the lack of exhaust bubbles in its wake, also took attention. Interwar building of a version proved elusive, primarily due to its limited range and, and speed, to the limited range and speed battery-powered motors offered. In summer 1941, Great Britain delivered a captured German G7E electric model to the neutral Americans, and Ordnance worked with General Electric and Westinghouse to create their own version, with 2,000 of these Mark 18s starting to arrive a year later. That is in mid-1942. For Rear Admiral William H.P. Blandy, Chief of the Bureau from 1941 to 43, 
These contractor built additions could ease the submarine forces shortage of weapons, an approach endorsed by Admiral Ernest J. King after he became commander in chief US fleet. Yet Mark 18 development also drew bureau staff and time, staff time and attention because testing it took another year as the bureau balanced its development amid unfolding reports of Mark 14 and 18 pro 14 and 15 problems, as well as developing, since Kathy Broom Williams is in the audience, the Mark 23 Fido, the first aerial guided weapon American aircraft to drop during the Second World War. Reports from submariners indicated torpedo problems as early as 1 January 1942. Both the Mark 10 and Mark 14 torpedoes exhibited depth keeping problems when respectively fired from the USS S-38 and USS Sargo off the Philippines. But the commander of the latter boat also assigned responsibility to the magnetic feature of the Mark 6 exploder and deactivated the remainder of those embarked as a result. Numerous further cases of weapons running too deep by the following summer created a rift between the Southwest Pacific Submarine Commander, Rear Admiral Lockwood, and his peer ordnance, Rear Admiral Blandy. By mid-1942, the former, now Commander Submarines U.S. Pacific Fleet, reported the previous six months had witnessed 19 failed submarine attacks due to torpedo failures, including some by otherwise most competent skippers whose viewpoints Lockwood respected. Slide, please. This is, uh, that's uh, Lockwood on the right, on the left, Blandy in the middle, and uh, Ralph Christie on the right. He went directly, that is, he, Lockwood, went directly to Chester Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief U.S. Pacific Fleet, who permitted Lockwood submariners to disarm the magnetic portion of the exploder. Space and time preclude ex extended explanation of the convoluted nature of Infixes 4, the three U.S. torpedo problems. Suffice to say, the weapons ran deeper than set, so they missed targets. The magnetic influence device proved too sensitive, so it would detonate at harmless distances from ships. And the contact portion of the Mark 6 exploder jammed, including the one that we've been allowed to inspect, causing a dud if it struck a target close to an ideal 90 degree angle. The three problems, the product of inadequate pre-war testing, obscured one another and slowed their solution, a situation also prevalent for the Creek Marina two years earlier. Only with the intervention of Lockwood, who oversaw test firings in Australia and Hawaii, did the problems get sequentially identified and resolved. It did not help that the operational submariner's case for, for that one of their front it did not help the operational submariners case that one of their frontline commanders, Rear Admiral Ralph W. Christie, seen here the captain on the right in the picture, Commander Submarine 7th Fleet, had previously helped develop the Mark VI. Known as Mr. Torpedo, Christie resisted calls to stop using it until after the second anniversary of Pearl Harbor, five months later than Lockwood. How could the Bureau of Ordnance be so blind to the problem? The volume of correspondence between Lockwood and Blandy suggests both sides took the issue seriously and more cordially than some post-war critics suggest. The former opened his letters of complaint using his nickname, using the nickname Dear Spike. They were one class year apart at the Naval Academy, where Blandy had won a notable gunnery prize. You can go over to Building 105 over there and see him, his name on the plaque there. While one June 1943 answer from Blandy responded, Quote, I have personally lost more sleep over that gadget than any of a thousand programs that confront me in running this $5 billion a year ordinance program. Close quote. The Bureau was busy, under pressure from the top to build new weapons of all types and faster, but what rationale could its leader offer for not resolving the top torpedo problems? Slightly earlier, Blandy's staff arrived at explanations suggesting the weapon had been improperly used. If fired against a merchant vessel, the Bureau noted, the magnetic feature would only work if the torpedo approached the central four-fifths of the ship's hull. Degaussing, a method for reducing the magnetic field of a ship, would also reduce the torpedo's chances of firing. Aiming under the keel of merchant ships further cut its effectiveness, which, would, which, would, which should instead be used, as Bureau staff put it, only against large armored men of war. Ordnance staff, add, ordnance staff did add a small electrical resistor to fix the problem, but Blandy himself admitted these and other accompanying instructions and accompanying instructions seemed, quote, rather complicated. In addition to production questions and Bureau of Ordnance and the Bureau of Ordnance blame directed at submarine crews, we can look at the experiences using the Mark 15 torpedo, very similar in design to the Mark 14. These torpedoes have been designed for use by surface warships and also used mm -hmm. Mark 6. As a measure of the compatibility, to ameliorate the shortage of weapons, some submarines carried Mark 15s in their lengthier stern tubes while on patrol. Just as with submariners, in late 1942, American destroyer crews reported problems of depth keeping as well as with dud Mark 15s either failing to explode, blowing up with low power, or detonating too far from a target. 
other problems prevailed. Just after Pearl Harbor, the broader Navy recognized demands for torpedo maintenance, but faced difficulties executing it. Before the fall of Manila, the Asiatic fleet all ordered all weapons inspected to ensure proper firing, and the, as they inspected before sailing. But one tender, USS Canopus, became trapped with its crew after the American forces withdrew to Bataan and was lost. Secrecy and experience with the new models played the role, played a role as well. To protect the exploder, as Frank observed, the Mark V version was what was installed. So in other words, crews hadn't seen the Mark VI and the repair staffs weren't familiar with them either. Maintenance was not straightforward, for in February 1942, just one single radio mate in Hawaii was qualified to maintain the Mark VI exploder <laughs> used by dozens of destroyers and submarines. Submarine torpedoes also had a problem because they were contained in submer and subsurface tubes, uh, sub torpedo tubes, which meant they would be immersed. Destroyer tenders did not get enough spare parts or tools, or even a dedicated repair manual for the Mark VI, another thing the Bureau of Ordnance had to do until mid until 1943. Battle experience directed attention elsewhere. Off Guadalcanal, Mark 15 torpedoes demonstrated flaws several times. On 26 March 1942, at the Battle of Santa Cruz, American destroyers Mustin and Anderson attempted to scuttle the aircraft carrier USS Hornet, badly damaged by Japanese airplanes. Slide, please. In attempting to explain these failures, one of the commanders noted his torpedoes needed maintenance of his crew, and his crew had not been able to install new firing springs on their Mark VI exploders. After the pair shelled the Hornet and left her burning, Japanese, Na Japanese Navy destroyers finished off the carrier. Admiral Chester Nimitz forwarded a report to Admiral King about the incident. In it, Nimitz cited defective parts and poor maintenance, rather than the Mark VI's magnetic function, which had been deactivated on torpedoes used, as the reason for the dud. Improper use of the Mark 15s during the nighttime naval battle of Guadalcanal three weeks later unveiled other, or unveiled more. Of 40 torpedoes fired by American destroyers on the early morning of 13 November 1942, as observed at the time, just two seemed to have exploded properly. In partial conformity to prescribed tactics, 14 of these, that's 35%, were shot at the Imperial Japanese Navy battleship Kiei, the highest value target most from extremely short ranges, which prevented them from arming. They did no damage. One contemporary classified Navy report of this action recognized that, tactically speaking, the torpedoes had been used improperly, a stance echoed by Nimitz's report once again to King. The combination of maintenance shortfalls and misuse by the surface fleet obscured technical failings of the weapons from the Bureau of Ordnance's eyes. Were these reasons possibly present in the submarine force before the summer of 1943, giving the Bureau reason to discount their concerns? Going back to the initial problems off Luzon in 1941, the USS Sargo fired at least one torpedo with an improperly installed Mark VI exploder, which allowed the device to flood and possibly short circuit. Improper maintenance certainly sounded like the surface fleet's self-reporting of being in a, unable to care for the weapons. Bureau counter-arguments about whether the submariners were shifting responsibility from shots missing the target to failed torpedoes also had at least a grain of evidence to back them up. The submarine force relieved 30% of its commanding officers for an adequate performance in 1942 alone, and another 14% in 1943. So many skippers have been found wanting, who in actuality quit, uh, sometimes quit out of frustration with malfunctioning weapons. Maybe it was easier to believe the fault lay with the users, not the torpedoes producers. These conditions all made diagnosing torpedo failures more complex. Problems with American submarine and surface ship torpedoes, including those with the Mark VI Exploder, arguably constitute the most egregiously failed Navy weapons created before the 1960s. Inadequate pre-war testing certainly played a leading role in not diagnosing what was wrong with the torpedoes and the Exploder, but the response after 1941 needs context. American ship captains reported problems with the surface and subsurface officers taking responsibility to differing degrees, suggesting <laughs> disparate perceptions of their torpedoes in the two communities. Rear Admiral Blandy attempted to resolve this crisis, but faced information input differences, as well as pressure from above and below, on this related set of weapons. His wholesale logistics problem, producing enough weapons for the US Navy, was in general not the concern of skippers who became frustrated by torpedo failures. Ultimately, it was solved only during a long war marked by enormous industrial mobilization with 54,000 weapons built. What is also notable, and here I'm about to wind up, are the number and prominence of the officers who developed American torpedoes and strove to solve their problems. 
The direct participants, Charles Lockwood, Ralph Christie, and William Blandy, show us that innovation or adaptation is tricky. On its face, Lockwood seems the innovation champion, resolving problems by empowering subordinates. Yet what about Christie, an experienced designer who helped create the Mark VI on a bargain budget of about $75,000? And why would the U.S. Navy, led by Admiral Ernest King, notably intolerant of less than stellar performers, trust Blandy to higher commands, which, next slide please, in 1946 included his leading the Crossroads atomic bomb test at Bikini Atoll. Why promote him after this failure? Finally, that King, along with Admirals William Leahy, Thomas Hart, William Halsey, and Chester Nimitz, all played at least minor roles in interwar torpedo development or solving the weapons problem suggest that innovators were closer to the mainstream than is commonly thought. Is there a member of the U.S. Navy's interwar all-star leadership team not on this list? Seen in that light, assigning blame is probably the least useful part of this story. Thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is Trent Hone, who is the author of Learning War, which I've reviewed very faithfully. <laughs> Learning War, the Evolution of Fighting Doctrine in the U.S. Navy, 1898 to 1945, which explores how the U.S. Navy developed learning mechanisms before World War II that accelerated victory during that conflict. Like the rest of his work, that study was fueled by an interest in organizational learning and operational effectiveness. Mr. Hone is also the co-author of Battle Line, the U.S. Navy, 1919-1939, and has contributed to several books, including To Crown the Waves, The Great Navies of the First World War, and on the Seas Contested, The Seven Great Navies of World War II, and The Battle of Leyte Gulf at 75, a retrospective. Mr. Hone has recently finished a study of Ch Admiral Chester W. Nimitz's approach to command, which uh, you're hearing the results of that today, expected from the U.S. Naval Institute Press in the fall of 2022. Trent, the floor is yours. You're ending. Uh, as soon as the slide comes up. Fantastic. Uh, so I very much appreciate Randy's presentation because it gets us to think about some of the challenges of organization and organizational capacity for understanding what is happening in the world around you. Uh, particularly the challenges that the Bureau of Ordnance faces making sense of what's happening with the torpedo problem. And I'm going to shift us a little bit and think more about Admiral uh, Nimitz's approach to command and organization in the Pacific in World War II. Uh, in a paper called Organizing for Rapid Sensemaking. And I believe that the choice to have Nimitz serve as both a operational commander, as commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet, sink back, and as a theater-level commander, commander-in-chief of the Pacific Ocean areas, sink POA, is a deliberate choice that accelerates the progress of war in the Pacific, although it has been criticized as a violation of sound military doctrine, and organization, uh, but I'm going to provide some examples for why I think this decision was justified and worked out quite well for the United States and its allies in the Pacific. Next slide, please. So Nimitz presages his approach in the Pacific in his War College Tactical Thesis of 1923. And in that, he lists four unchanging principles of warfare, the employment of the utmost energy, concentration of superior strength at the decisive point, Avoiding loss of time. Time is a very important component for Nimitz and other U.S. Navy officers at this time. And following up every advantage. And as Singpoa and Singpak, he was able to employ these concepts, accelerate Allied offenses in the Pacific, and help bring the war to a successful conclusion. Next slide, please. Now, first, I think it's very important to talk about the fact or to recognize the fact that Nimitz's staff structure early in the war is emergent. It, it emerges based on circumstances. And it doesn't follow a predefined path because there is no set structure for U.S. naval staffs during this time. So when he becomes Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet in late December 1941, he makes the deliberate decision to keep on existing staff members. He does not bring in his team. He works with the, the substance that he has there. He works with the staff, former staff members of Admiral Hudson Kimball, and also those of Vice Admiral William S. Pye, the interim fleet commander. And Nimitz is very aggressive. He wants to come to grips with the Japanese, but at the same time, he has limited capacity, like the leaders of the Bureau of Ordnance. 
So he focuses his attention on that, which he thinks is the most important goal. How do we get a sense? How do we understand how to come to grips with the Japanese? Well, I have a war plan section headed by uh, Captain Charles St. Morris there on the left. And yes, Socrates. <laughs> and um, his able assistant, Commander Lynn McCormick, there in the center. They are very aggressive as well. They are interested in the same kind of idea. So Nimitz works with them, and more specifically, to formulate the initial offensive operations, the raids into the Marshall Islands, and then later McCormick to thwart the Japanese attempt to capture Fort Moresby at the Battle of Coral Sea in May 1942, and then concentrate superior force at the decisive point to win at Midway in June. Now, Nimitz is able to focus his attention on these things, to free up sufficient capacity to do that because he bifurcates the work of the staff. He dedicates attention to that, to these operations, and he delegates more routine, more predictable work to his chief of staff, Rear Admiral Neil Dremel, pictured there on the right. So Dremel is responsible for training sorties, convoy routing, things like that, allowing Nimitz to focus his attention on Coral Sea Midway, other operations of that like. Nimitz maintains this bifurcation, this kind of approach, as his staff grows and as it becomes increasingly sophisticated. Next slide, please. At the same time, Nimitz is able to keep his staff relatively small because he believes it's important to keep the staff small so that information can travel through it more rapidly, so that you can more rapidly make sense of emerging information by delegating to joint command. After the combined chiefs of staff decide that all theater commands are going to be joint and combined, that is, there's going to be a single theater commander responsible for all forces within the theater, Nimitz takes a very U.S. Navy-centric approach to this. We're not going to centralize jointness at a general headquarters level. Instead, we are going to push jointness down. Right? So there are a number of joint commands that are established in major areas, like the South Pacific, but also different islands, like Numea or Samoa. These are joint commands. And through the latter half of 1942 and much of 1943, Nimitz is able to keep his staff small, keep his attention focused on the things that he thinks are most important by relying on effective subordinates in these areas, or at least ultimately finding effective subordinates in these areas. Because as we know, the initial South Pacific commander, like Admiral Gormley, did not work out as well. And in the North Pacific, Rear Admiral Robert Theobald does not work out quite as well either. So they were replaced by these individuals, William F. Halsey on the left, who replaces Gormley, succeeds in the campaign of the Canal, and then begins to advance northwest through the Solomon in mid-1943. And then Rear Admiral Thomas Kincaid, in a warm jacket suitable for Aleutian conditions, where he is pictured, <laughs> uh, begins to work very effectively with the Army, establishes a collaborative relationship kind relationship that Theobald was not able to create. And this ultimately allows Kincaid and his peers in the army to push the Japanese out of the Aleutians. Now, both of these men are effective, collaborative joint commanders who allow Nimitz to prepare for an upcoming Central Pacific Venture by continuing to keep the pressure on the Japanese in the South and North Pacific. Next slide, please. Now, for the, ascent, the offensive in the Central Pacific, it is very important the Nimitz avoids loss of time. He wants to move quickly, right? Because the combined chiefs of staff, yeah, I apologize for the resolution of that. There was an organizational chart from September 1943. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but the combined chiefs of staff and the joint chiefs of staff want to force a Japanese surrender within a year after the defeat of Germany, which at this point is anticipated by the end of 1944. So by the end of 1945, then, to do the math, Nimitz have to establish the conditions to create or impose Japanese surrender before the end of 1945. Now, to do this, to prepare for this rapid offensive movement through the Central Pacific, where it is recognized that there is the greatest opportunity to move quickly, he reconfigures, Nimitz reconfigures his command and staff structure, leading to this joint command structure that you see introduced in September of 1943. Now, there's pressure from the Army to create a general headquarters structure, very much like General Douglas MacArthur had created in the Southwest Pacific, 
Reynolds White Eisenhower had created in Europe, and these are large organizations. They're nearly an order of magnitude larger than limited staff structure. If you look at Eisenhower's staff structure at the time, a little over 900 officers, 900. And Nimitz's was only a bit over 100, about 150. So it's nearly an order of magnitude difference in size. And if Nimitz were to do this, then he would be removed from the fleet command to become the theater commander. And some suitable candidate, all he was recommended, would become the fleet commander. Nimitz doesn't want to do this. He chooses to do something different. He and his, uh, he and Admiral Ernest King, commander in chief, chief of naval operations, think it's going to be more effective to leave Nimitz dual headed, remain St. Pat, remain St. Poa. And one of the main reasons is because they think that the fleet has the potential to be an arm of strategic decision. Right? If they are able to trigger a fleet action against the Imperial Japanese Navy, this will unlock greater opportunities to advance more rapidly across the Pacific. So it's very important, in their belief, to have fleet command coupled with theater command, leave Nimitz dual headed. So rather than a general headquarters, King suggests two separate staffs, one for St. Pat, one for St. Poa. This is what we see here. This is what is ultimately introduced, what Nimitz does. And he addresses the Army's criticism by integrating them more effectively into this joint staff and especially by creating a dedicated logistics division headed by Brigadier General Edmund H. Levy of the Army Service Forces. He brings forth his knowledge and a more Army-centric perspective into how to do logistics in the Central Pacific Theater. That will be very important to maintain the momentum of the offensive, but it continues the bifurcation of the staff structure that Nimitz has already chosen to, to, to use so that he can maintain focus on upcoming plans and operations. Next slide, please. In addition, in order to capitalize on his position as St. Pat and St. Poa, Nimitz establishes an unusual command structure in the Central Pacific. So unlike in the North Pacific and the South Pacific, where there's this area commander who is subordinate to Nimitz, Nimitz creates uh, an unusual structure with Spruance. He's gonna work with Vice Admiral Rain Spruance, the Central Pacific Force Commander, later the fleet commander, the picture here is the two of them walking, uh, walking together, something that they did quite often. Now, Spruance had joined Nimitz's staff after the Battle of Midway. They spent a great deal of time together. They had developed a series of tacit and implicit understandings of how the offensive would unfold. They had also planned a great deal together. So Nimitz feels like this shared understanding is going to allow him to work effectively through Spruance kind of blur some of the lines of responsibility between them, but more effectively integrate tactical action to strategic outcomes through more rapid feedback between the two of them. Next slide, please. And a great example of this occurs in the early stages of the, of the offensive. Right? So it begins with the invasion of the Guild of Islands, operations of Galvanic in November 1943, but that has always been considered a bit of an intermediate objective. Right? So the first true substantial objective is to break into the Japanese defenses in the Marshall Islands. But Nimitz is unsure how to do it. He needs to seize three objectives that this is what they have decided. There's got to be an anchorage for the fleet, and there's got to be two air bases so that there is uh, sufficient room for air power to dominate the islands of the Marshalls that are not invaded. And Nimitz needs to do this in one bite. That is what King insists upon, and is what the timeline that the Joint Chiefs of Staff are suggesting uh, requires. But Nimitz doesn't have the resources, at least isn't sure how his resources can allow him to do this in one bite, right? He's only got so much in figure foot capacity, he only has so much in the way of troops. And while he and his planners are pondering what to do, after the successful invasion of the Gilbert Islands, Spruance capitalizes on the success of that, sends the carrier forces of the Central Pacific to raid the marshes. They do so. And that raid reveals that there is a large airfield that will support bombers on Kwajalein Island on the southern portion of Kwajalein Atoll. This is new information. This had not been known before. But it creates the potential now, through this tactical, tactical action, to change the Marshall Islands operation, Operation Flintlock, 
to go directly to Colangeline Hat Pole. Because on the northern portion, the Twin Islands of Roy and Moore, there is room for an airfield. On the southern island, Kwajalein, there is already an airfield. And we can anchor in the center of the atoll. You can also see he's slightly defended Majuro, which is not too far away. And this is what Nimitz and his planet decide to do. But when he introduces it to his operational commander, Sperance, Rear Admiral Richmond K. Turner, commander of the amphibious forces, and Marine Major General Holland Smith, they don't think the plan will work. It is too far. But Nimitz is confident that it will succeed and he overrules them. And the assault on Kwajalein effectively collapses Japanese defenses in the market. Now, because Nimitz and his planners have put together a campaign plan, a granite campaign plan, that is architected as a series of options, I like to think of, about, of it as a, as a scaffolding that facilitates more rapid strategic decisions. These are options that can be executed when the time is right. And so now, Japanese defenses in the Marshall Islands have been overwhelmed more rapidly as they had anticipated. Spruance immediately acts to execute the next option, which is the operations that will seize and Weetok and raid the Japanese fleet base at Truk. He does this. Now, convinced that Truk is no longer tenable as a major base, the Japanese fleet effectively evacuates it and they retreat to their next series of defenses. So success in the marshals unlocks new strategic options which Spruance and Nimitz capitalize on very quickly because of this relationship they have and because of the use of granite as a series of options. Next slide, please. Now, the Japanese do not sit idly by while this happens, right? They adapt, they adjust. And to reinforce the next line of defenses in the Marianas, and around Palau. And in this phase of the offensive, Nimitz and his sense-making organization trigger three decisions that are crucial to sustaining and accelerating the pace of the offensive. First, more resistance is encountered in the Marianas than anticipated. Nimitz's intelligence organization underestimates the number of defenders of Saipan and fails to recognize that the Japanese are willing to fight a decisive fleet action uh, at the Marianas. So in July, Nimitz quickly adjusts. Plans for the next operation, Operation Stalemate, the campaign for Palau, are adjusted. Objectives are dropped from that operation. We now have Stalemate 2. And this is going to allow Nimitz to maintain the offense's momentum and keep it in line with the resources, the limited resources that we have. Second, once Stalemate begins in September, now, Admiral Halsey has assumed command of the Central Pacific Forces as commander of the Third Fleet. He raids the Philippines, and as we all know, resistance in the Philippines is less than anticipated. Halsey immediately recommends, let's drop a series of intermediate objectives, let's cancel stalemate, let's go to Leyte. And Nimitz isn't prepared to go quite that far. He retains certain stalemate objectives, Peleliu and Guar, but he does free up the assault forces who were planned for Yap and makes them available to Leahy, triggers a decision at the JCS level to authorize that operation in October. So that's the second decision. And finally, by the end of September, Nimitz and his planners have realized that the anticipated invasion of Formosa, Operation Causeway, is not feasible. There are insufficient resources, not just within Nimitz's theater, but across the Pacific in its entirety, to execute this operation successfully. And so, in a conference with King at San Francisco, at the end of that month, September, Nimitz shares this fact. Planners in Washington have already ascertained the same thing, so King is aware. He takes the news fairly well, but immediately asks for alternatives. Okay, if we don't go to Formosa, where do we go next? And Nimitz is prepared the two recommendations that Admiral Spruance has offered, Iwo Jima and Okinawa. These become Nimitz's next objectives. Next slide, please. However, before Nimitz can execute these operations, the campaign in the Philippines must play out, and the Pacific fleet has to support MacArthur's capture of Leyte, Endoro, and then Luzon. Now, this is where the flaws in Nimitz's unusual Central Pacific command arrangements begin to be seen, right? Because he has established a series of tacit understandings with Spruance about how the offensive should play out. Halsey 
having believed Schrantz, lacks the same level of shared understanding. He's been given all the documentation. He's also been given a long leash to go after the Japanese fleet. But what Halsey focuses on is tactical operations at the expense of the long-term viability of the offensives. Effectively, because of the increased Japanese resistance in the Philippines, Halsey risks exhausting the carrier forces. And there are a series of messages that Nimitz has to send him, to remind him, once with a very stern admonishment, that you have to leave time for the carriers to rest. We need to ensure that the follow-on operations can be successful. We don't want the offensive to stop in the Philippines. And eventually this works. However, the strength of Japanese resistance not only delays timelines within the Philippines, delays when Bosch is captured in Zoro and Kazan, but it also pushed back Nimitz's timelines for Iwo Jima and Okinawa by a month. Next slide, please. And the Japanese use this month very well, right? Because now they have adopted a strategy that is, quote, designed to make the Americans pay the maximum price in blood for every year, right? The intent is to draw off the war, exhaust the patience of the American people, and secure a peace on more favorable terms and negotiate with Nimitz's intelligence organization fails to detect this changing nature of Japanese tactics, underestimates the numbers of defenders on Iwo Jima and Okinawa, and on Iwo Jima, the Japanese almost force another delay in Nimitz's timeline. Uh, it's only the uncommon valor of the Marines that allow Operation Iceberg, the assault on Okinawa, to occur on time. But even so, Nimitz has already dropped a number of objectives, minor objectives from it. And then, with the fighting ashore on Okinawa stalemated and the fleet being subjected to a series of mass kamikaze attacks, Nimitz adjusts again, drops two major objectives from Operation Iceberg, Miyako Jima and Hikajima, with the decision not to invade the region. And at the same time, Nimitz begins to adjust his thoughts on invasion, which has been held up by the army as necessary to force a decision and trigger Japanese surrender. Now, by May, because of his experience, Iwo Jima and Okinawa Nimitz is opposed to invasion. Doesn't think it makes sense anymore. King knows this. And in early August, he packages up the messages that have been exchanged between General George C. Marshall, the Chief of Staff, the Army, and General MacArthur. And MacArthur is dismissive of new intelligence that has arisen about the strength of Japanese defenses on Kyushu, the invasion's initial target, and thinks that the invasion should go forward and it will succeed. And King does this because he knows that Nimitz is no longer interested in an invasion, no longer thinks it's the right idea. But two atomic bombs and the entry of the Soviet Union into the war trigger a Japanese surrender before Nimitz can respond. We don't know what he would expect. However, I think it's fairly reasonable to conclude that Nimitz would have shared his most recent assessments about the strength of Japanese defenses, about their determination to draw out the war, about their determination to uh, pay, make the Americans pay the maximum price in blood for every yard, uh, and would have recommended against the invasion. Next slide. So, to wrap things up, in his thesis, 1923 thesis again, Nimitz quotes Card Admiral Bevington, and this uh, said something quite interesting, that there's no sharp dividing line between strategy and tactics. The main difference between them is that the strategist sees with the eye of the mind, and the tactician sees with the actual eye of the body. And I contend that by serving as Sinkak and Sinkoa, as being dual-hatted in this way, Nimitz was able to see with both of these eyes, bring them together in one person, effectively one staff, and then rapidly couple tactical success to strategic goals. Now, from the context of individual battles, like the Philippine Sea or the Gulf, it's possible to see the flaws in this approach, right? The blurred lines that Nimitz creates between his responsibilities and those that screw into Halsey do lead to confusion, and they do lead to some uncertainty. However, I think that, that those problems are outweighed by the broader strategic benefits that were gained by the fact that Nimitz and his staff structure could rapidly process newly available information, act on it, to not only maintain the pace of the offensive, but repeatedly accelerate it, thereby invalidating the main Japanese strategy of 
delay, increasing costs in American lives, and drawing out the war. Um, and I think that this is an essential view as you think about, particularly recent American uh, campaigns or, or combat, Iraq, Afghanistan, wars that have gone on a very long time. And if you look at the success of World War II, very often you attribute it to great material superiority. That is a fact that cannot be denied, but how that was used, how that was put into place, and how it was uh, enabled success was due in large part to the structures and the sense-making organizations that American and allied commanders created. And that is a main point of my paper, and I think it ties together some of the other things that we have heard on this panel. So now, I conclude, and I... I will introduce our commentator, Dr. Angelina Callahan. She received a BA in history from Armstrong Atlantic State University and a PhD in history of technology and science at Georgia Tech. Her dissertation tracked how tri-service and international collaboration with Cold War space technologies maintained multilateral security, contributing to a co-authored book on NASA's history of Cold War international collaboration. Callahan worked at the Naval Research Laboratory 11 years, where she supported commanding officers, numerous SESs, and, and NRL researchers. Working across 18 divisions, she pieced together case studies explaining the often lengthy lead time for scientific knowledge to transition to naval systems. These histories inform tasks, data calls, VIP visits, conference talks, and assorted publications. Her research traces how Navy leadership in space and upper atmospheric <coughs> sciences yielded first generation application satellites for the Navy and set precedents for a rules based order in space, at least up until now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start so grateful to be a part of this panel. Thank you for including me on um, in many regards, this is a panel of best laid plans, but <coughs> in many regards of the folks who didn't show up in the torpedo that we have explored that we had hoped would also be able to make it here. But also in terms of the content of the papers that we're going to be discussing, and Randy knows that I love a good case study in failure. Um, <laughs> but in light of the room full of subject matter experts who are also eager to ask questions, I'll try to be really quick and succinct, but I'll still be a little bit selfish in the questions that I ask. Um, in terms of the history of technology, I wanted to make a note about Dr. Blazich and his methodologies. Um, we're driven to reflect on how empirical knowledge, learning by doing through reproducible methodological testing, may have been a key component in the potential lethality of a weapon. With almost dizzying in-depth detail, Dr. Blazich, mm -hmm. if I may, beats us about the head and neck with technical details so that we can better visualize not just the mechanical complexity of this instrument, but the labor and skilled complexity that goes into it as well um, in, in pre-mass produced cut and fitted parts. My questions are both, I'm a bit myopic and selfish and directed at both uh, Dr. Blasich and Dr. Papadopoulos. Um, these are perhaps immeasurably complex to produce and maintain, um, but can you speak to the decision to not better mechanize the production of these. Can you speak about proponents who wanted to better mechanize production? Um, who were they, Randy? Mm -hmm. Perhaps you have run across that, uh, Dr. Blazic. Uh, what were the challenges or reverse salience? Were there particular instruments on it that were just, because you, 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 you kind of gestured from a, in a quote in a primary document to the idea that it was impossible to make it the mass produced interest instrument. Um, I'm not entirely persuaded of that, as mm -hmm. by the historical actors at least. And, and also, I'm curious, uh, was the Bureau of Ordnance in parallel working on mass production of next generation systems that were more successful? Um, my second question, uh, concerning reports of misuse and the questions about the degree to which this is a failed technology or the failed use of technology or both plus other failings. Um, I'm curious about the formal reporting structures and the reward structures around reporting for this for sailors. I know that in World War II, the Bureau of Aeronautics was in their Bureau of Aeronautics Digest, which I think was a weekly or bi-weekly publication that came out. They basically begged sailors to send in RUBM, I forgot what that stands for, report, in which the Bureau of Aeronautics could be more methodically evaluating the, 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 the function and the capabilities of systems or tricks for how to better maintain these systems. Um, and I asked this 
not just because of hoping to fill in yet another gap of what went wrong in the system, but because there's also a little bit of a political element to this too, correct? Like, like if the sailors could have been reporting it, would that have circumvented the political, uh, the higher level uh, conversations about the ramifications of this? Mm. Um, I don't know. Um, so those are my only two questions for you too. Um, for <laughs> Mr. Holmes, um, you often use the term delegate when you're talking about logistics and supply. And um, I'm curious the degree to which the word relegate might be inserted in a few of those instances. And if that's the case, would you say that's you adopting actor language? Or do you think that's, is that, is that the author speaking or is that the historic actors speaking? Because mm. by the end, Nimitz does come under criticism for not having adequate supply chain. Well, it's actually in the middle, too. He comes under criticism for not having adequate supply chain, not estimating supply needs adequately. Um, and it's easy for me to sit here in the comfort of this room and, and throw rocks. But um, I, I am curious your thoughts on his philosophies around the value of those functions and if he may have had biases against those. You, you can see where I'm going with that. Mm -hmm. um, and also, if not for the advent of the atomic bombs, I'm curious the degree to which this might have been another case study in complete failure, as, as, as you're indicating. I, I wasn't staring at the PowerPoint the whole time because I was taking notes while you were talking. I loved how on page 15 you had a beautiful breakout of a table of operations, objectives, target dates, and the dates that they were executed. This was not in your PowerPoint, correct? It was not. I won't hold that against you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that this is a really compelling argument that, that sets up this tension, this narrative tension in your paper, in which we have um, the brewer operation, we have catch pole, we have reckless, we have forager, we have stalemate, all of which are happening three weeks, two and a half months, two and a half months, four and a half months, two and a half months earlier than anticipated by leadership. This is, this is a really impressive momentum that they're still sustaining, moving faster than they anticipate, planning as well as they possibly can. And then they just hit this brick wall with David Chima and Aitanola, right? Like, like a literal lowercase stalemate, not, not the operation <laughs> stalemate. And, um, and, and that, that's kind of disconcerting um, in terms of the question of, you know, if not for the atomic bomb and Soviet Union entering, you know, that this would have ended somehow different. I don't like atomic actual history. But um, maybe one way that this could be spun as a success in the longer term might be if you could answer the question of, of who learned from this and how the Navy adapted in Korea or subsequent conflicts um, from this, or did other, you know, was there a methodical evaluation of these questions, or are you the first to do that? And then finally, my last selfish question, the whole time that I was reading this, I, uh, I had the language of contemporary force design and planning documents spinning around in my head, and I'm curious if there's any particular reason that you're not applying the notion of you could throw in, you know, like lowercase distributed maritime operations or, you know, just throw in wholesale EABO or tri service maritime coordination. <laughs> 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 My question was, was that supposed to be subtle or were you just talking to a bunch of historians as your audience? Historians are just totally naive because you wanted to be subtle so that people just pick up on the, what I. Perceived to be applications to contemporary planning. Um, sorry. No, no, no. That's great. That's great. I, yeah. Thank you. Frank, Frank, you want to do the, the, the first questions? Hi, everybody. It's really weird seeing myself on the screen from here. It's very meta, so forgive me if I'm weirded out by seeing myself. Uh, regarding the Mia culpa, I'm not able to dig in, go up to Newport to obtain the archival records that I would like about the torpedo station's operations. But what I can offer there, why did they not mechanize production? Part of this goes down to really, one could argue, the culture beginning with torpedo manufacturing in the United States. Almost every single one of them is hand-built, hand-assembled, hand-fitted, uh, tuned mechanism. They're arguably some of the most complicated weapon systems that we have at that point in operation in the Navy. And the secrecy factor surrounding the Mark VI is probably the biggest problem here. So one group of people is, are making parts. It might be a single machinist at their lathe making one component or one set of gears. 
And then those parts are getting taken to a separate room where a separate group of people is, is assembling them into the complete exploders and then testing them. And how much information are they passing back to the folks actually building the individual components saying, could you, you know, adjust this? Could you remove a, a thousandth of a millimeter of metal here or something? I quite frankly don't know. I do believe that some of this, one could argue, is cultural to New England. When we think about the manufacturing industries in New England, when we think about the long arc of, of New England, even the, the anti-countermining device in many ways is similar to the shock absorber on a watch. And so when we think of the watch manufacturing industry in New England, you almost wonder if the Navy recruited folks out of there who brought their kind of sensibilities of manufacturing and their sensibilities of uh, kind of keeping uh, trade secrets, if you will, up here rather than documenting everything, which invariably is going to inhibit any opportunity to create an assembly line to really mass produce the weapons. We also have to remember that from really about 1923 to 1937, Newport is the only game in town. They are the sole brain trust of all torpedo assembly, research, and development in the entire United States. That the contracts with EW Bliss to manufacture torpedoes, I believe, end in 1921 or 22, followed by some glorious lawsuits over that matter, uh, which, you know, topic for another day, so to speak. Uh, and it's actually not until 1937 that the factory that the Navy built in Alexandria, Virginia, which is now a fantastic art art gallery for those who've been there. Uh, that factory, they didn't even break ground on it until 1918. Uh, it shutters in 1923 and they don't actually reopen it until 1937 to begin assembling Mark 14 torpedoes. And that's a whole nother bag of cats with the problems that they had getting things stood up. Uh, is it is it right? Is it, is it good? Should we condemn the award or should we celebrate them? Uh, some of that ties into more of Randy's paper and the Navy's awareness of the volume of torpedoes they need, the wasting factor of torpedoes that you're going to need and the ones you're gonna to have to assemble. At the time, the kind of you know, assembly line, uh, hand assembly uh, of the weapons, it wasn't causing problems, so to speak, in the grand scheme of things. But Randy, I turn the other half over to you. Except for the numbers, uh, Angel thing, yeah. Um, with regard to Angel's second point, um, there are reporting systems. The pre-war reporting system, of course, is a series of forms. Going back to 1914, when I did my dissertation research, I actually found reports signed by a Lieutenant Husband Kimmel on board the USS, Pencil USS, Aris no, USS Pennsylvania, that's right, um, from 1914. They had a checklist of what was wrong, what went wrong when a torpedo did not run, as they said, hot, straight, and true. Um, an interesting linguistic use in that time. Um, and, and the answer was typically um, user error. Uh, it was, it, there, was, there was an entry for design, design, but typically it was something wrong in proper maintenance, improper firing, something like that. So the, the list was actually foreshortened for in, in the pre-war period. Once the war gets going and you've got submariners patrol reports, and of course the, the, the war diaries from the, from the warships that fire them at sea, then you're getting a whole different series of, of, of incentives and the problem there, of course, is that there is indeed a reward system for being, as the Navy termed it, productive. <laughs> and uh, productive patrol captains are the ones that get Navy crosses and ultimately medals of honor. And so there's an incentive not to attribute your own failure to something now. But that, do those go to the bureaus or do they go to the operational Navy? They go to the operational Navy and they're shared by the submarine force amongst one another. So they're reading one another's reports. Not the now, as far as I can tell, not the beer. I don't know is the short answer, but uh, we can talk about that uh, when we get after Trent does. No, no, I want to give you a chance to respond. Yeah, lots of wonderful questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will just start from uh, from the most recent uh, about contemporary force terms. I heard a groan in the room when that came up, <laughs> um, and I'm I'm deliberately not using them because I don't want to anchor the historical behavior and operations to a modern a modern term. I would rather someone make that link themselves. Also, I didn't want to spend time uh, defining the modern term, my impression of the modern term, and, and trying to impose that lens back onto the past. I thought it would be better to, to look at what was happening and then see if there are principles to draw up that might be applicable to, to the current state or the future uh, and let that happen. Uh, the brick wall that you mentioned Right, they, there is a, you alluded to the table, uh, here, 
I ran anybody can see it. I did have a slide with that table uh, in various rehearsals to make sure that I stuck within time limits to sell off because it was very easy to get into the details of all these different operations and we are familiar with a lot of those. Uh, but you're right, there is this acceleration up to a point, right? And then it gets to the Philippines and it begins to slow down. And, and a lot of this is due to the fact that then the optionality basically stops. You get to a point where, well, the Japanese know where you're going and they can prepare. <laughs> And they do. Um, now, you ask also, you know, who learned from this? I, ha I have not studied the Korean era with the, nearly the level of detail, so I'm not sure what my found way into that. But I suspect one of the things that I'm trying to argue for is, you know, industry's organizational structure is different, and it is different from what we inherit from the integration of the services in the late 1940s. And so I'm trying to highlight some of the value that it has in the hope that we can think about jointness being structured in slightly different ways depending on what we're trying to accomplish or the circumstances that we face. I know there are other people who have said similar things, but I'm not sure that that lesson has really resonated or hit home. And I hope it does. It sounds like John Hume might have something to say about that in a minute. Let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, delegate versus relegate uh, historic language. I'm using delegate because that is the term for maybe familiar with as a class. It's a historic term. Relegate uh, may be appropriate. I would have to think about that. Uh, what I think is very interesting about this is that Nimitz understands the importance of logistics. He knows it's vital. He knows it's essential. Um, but he doesn't get as far into the details of it himself. He lets subordinates like Calhoun, the service force commander, do a lot of this work. And then he lets uh, the armed service forces do a lot of this work. And, and ultimately it succeeds. But I think it succeeds because he is giving them objectives, this is what we need. This is what the logistics have to do. This is what the capabilities have to allow for. And then lets them figure out how to do it, which is, of the time, very much a naval way of doing things. Give your subordinate an objective and let, let them tell them how to do it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, questions then. Uh, <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, all right, John Q and Craig Simons, you, sir. And, uh, we'll start with those three and see how we do. Okay, for uh, I've got a question for Frank and Randy, and then but I'll ask Trent the question first, which is, is, I, you think that there's 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 some opportunity here to sort of look at this. I know her, uh, her question was, uh, Caroline's question was, about was was there a learning process in place both at the time and then after the war in terms of this staff structure and approach. Um, and I, I would mention here Arlie Burke's really great article that Proceedings republished at the beginning of the War on Terror about Arlie Burke saying we actually were learning wrong lessons mm -hmm. and, and implemented unification and that we were really trying to even go back to sort of Minimus method uh, in his in his uh, when he was promoted to a two star admiral mm -hmm. and, and and what we should do and uh, uh, so there's a, there's a look at that but my question to you is did you as you kind of get to the end and the wall piece. Uh, you start to kind of make another thesis statement, which is which is about what would this structure have done uh, in the face of the bombs and August storm of Soviet invasion, uh, in addition to all the other things that took place in the previous four years, not leading to a Japanese surrender. Um, and I would ask you, how does that stack up, that organizational piece with, with Nimitz and his staff and King? Uh, in the face of the scholarship of E.M. John Greco and the idea that the inertia for downfall in Olympic and Cornet is just overwhelming. And if you don't get that Hail Mary pass, it's, it's not going to happen. So what might the staff have done to overcome that, that organizational inertia coming from Washington and coming from Marshall uh, for downfall in the invasion of the I think it's, it's, it is hard to say. But I think King is trying to trigger a very public confrontation using Nimitz's reputation as an effective, honest broker to say, look, we shouldn't do this. Now, there's a lot of inertia, absolutely. Uh, so it's hard to say what would happen. But you're right. I do think that it just gets into uh, another potential thesis. And another challenge that I didn't directly allude to, uh, but have talked more about in other places, is you know, there is theater integration that happens in the Pacific, too. Right, you know, MacArthur has become commander of all the army forces, Nimitz is now commander of all the navy forces, and that is causing problems because MacArthur has one sense of jointness, Nimitz has a different sense, and they do not mesh. And so that, the invasion, if it goes forward, is going to draw out the problems 
and the lack of effective teaming between those different tiers. Yeah, like I know. Yeah. That, now for Frank and for Frank and, and Randy, I just did you either of you guys kind of look at, at comparative pieces? I know Randy has looked at the Germans, but there is a successful torpedo program in the war. And it's the Lance, it's the long lance torpedo by the yeah. Japanese. And so what's been done on that or is there a print to go? Randy, do you want to go first, or I can go myself? Why don't you start? Okay, yeah, sorry. The audio can be difficult here. So. Uh, quite frankly, I haven't dug into all of that, but what I can say is the Japanese were willing to test uh, the long land, well, the Type 93. Let's get the correct name here, not the one invented by a historian after the war. It was tested extensively against uh, live uh, target ships and targets, but... Let's put this in another perspective. They really test. What is the testing two of the Mark 14 focused on? It's test. It's testing the physical torpedo, right? It's not so much focused on the exploder. And this is what I find so fascinating from a historiographical perspective. Nobody talks about the exploder mechanism. We talk about the development of the torpedo. We talk about its propulsion, hot, straight, and true. Not will it go bang and explode when you hit something. And that I find is really remarkable. It is a huge hole. In the historiography, there's just find sec show me secondary source material that really digs into the testing of the exploder mechanism, and this is where I find it fascinating because the Mark VI, there's that evolutionary element of the impact, the inertia impact device. Since the Mark III, the only testing I could find pre World War One, and mind you, because I can't get in the archives, I'm using secondary sources or newspaper reports. They would test it, but they didn't test the actual exploder. They tested the concept of if we say put a sea mine against underneath a caisson and detonate it, and say this is how modern armor works on warships. This is how modern uh, you know, torpedo bulges work or bulkhead design. In the one case, they did test a Whitehead Mark One that was on a guided track to hit impact a precise point on the monitor USS Florida's hull. So the focus wasn't even there on the, will the exploder work? It's almost an implicit assumption. Of course it's going to work. We designed it. it. It'll work. The focus is rather on the getting the torpedo, right? Creating an effective torpedo with the warhead size and the speed and the, and the, the, the accuracy, if you will, and depth control, which that's a whole other bag of cats on the Mark 14 and Mark 10. And so it's an inter that's where I kind of gravitated to the topic. So Frank's rant over. I <laughs> will turn it over to Randy. Um, I looked at the comparison with the German torpedo designs, and they're, uh, they're also, what keyed me to this specific topic is that a major concern for the German Navy in the first part of the Second World War is indeed production again. They're looking at exactly the same thing. Where do the Germans get their aerial torpedoes that they'll line up using off of the Ju-87 Stuka or off of uh, the various types of other aircraft in the Luftwaffe from Italy? They actually send, but it's the same person trying to solve the problem a Dr. Cornelius, who has to go to Rome to negotiate for the purchase of torpedoes from the Italians, who's also designated the torpedo Führer, the, the language is actually used in the German documents. So they have this, they've got, they've got this exact same problem of, 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 a, of a throughput with somebody as the, as the expert responsible for doing it. The one other thing, of course, to note about the German example is that they put four people on trial and convict three in a Reichskriegsgericht, that's a, a war, a war uh, criminal, a criminal war court, um, and then they have to bring two of them back to help fix the problem. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a really strange situation. The British example during the, 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 the sinking of the Bismarck, the attempt to sink the Bismarck, also with contact magnetic exploders dropped from swordfish, torp uh, swordfish torpedo bombers, they hit the water and detonate on, on hitting the water. So again, everybody has problems with magnetic exploders. The Japanese, of course, don't use magnetic exploders during the war. I think that answered the question. Um, oh, sorry. oh, Craig, I'm sorry, Craig. Yes. Well, that's all right. Uh, first, I'm going to mention to Frank. I, you probably already know this, but when uh, uh, John and I were, one of the things that Stacy Perillo, the ARP, required were all the records from 1923 to 1930. They were then in the process of organizing. They were in the process of organizing those papers. Yet, but that may be a source to help you answer an awful lot of questions. No. You didn't know about that. That's that's a gold mine waiting. Oh, for you. thank you. 
again, the limitation because of the pandemic, I was extraordinarily, I can't even get into the Smithsonian's own archives to find out where the particular exploder we have came from. Because there's apparently a potentially a file, but I've been extraordinarily hamstrung by this whole research project. So I thank you, because this is kind of a start, I hope, of a deeper dive into really understanding this su such a fascinating object that if it had worked, if they had worked, how would the Pacific War have been different? Uh, and so, thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, on uh, Nimitz and Lockwood, which yes. is an interesting relationship. You know, yes. Nimitz had, had uh, several very close friends, one of whom was Ray Spruance, of course, mm -hmm. but the other was Charlie Lockwood. Yeah. Charlie Lockwood lived, and his chief of staff lived across the street on Makalapa Drive mm -hmm. from Nimitz in Oahu. Uh, Charlie was one of the few people Nimitz allowed to have his wife live there. I mean, Catherine stayed stateside, mm -hmm. but Betty Lockwood mm -hmm. lived in Hawaii, and they used to play doubles tennis all the time. So they were very close. Mm -hmm. And to follow up on... Uh, did did Lockwood take the story to uh, the bureau, and and he did. Uh, after he conducted these experiments, yeah. uh, he then went to Washington and talked with the bureau and and their associates. And there's a transcript that has him saying, "If you won't give us a weapon that will actually function, then give us some grappling hooks so we can come <laughs> alongside and rip the metal plates off the sides of the ship." So he was pretty sarcastic. Oh, he was pretty sarcastic about it. Okay. okay. All right. Sure. Hi, Rand. Um, I'm Peyton Lee Jibbert, and I work at NRL in my real life. Uh, now, you asked a question, why promote Blandy when he was incompetent? And I can't help but think of the example of John Beeling, who was the commander of the USS Forrestal in the fire hassle, right? Zuni rockets, known to be a problem, known to short out, <coughs> and still had the planes on the deck packed like hot cakes. The one hits McCain's plane, mm -hmm. it almost goes down. And what happens to Beeling after? He's uh, detached to work on the uh, CNO Sat War, because Moore liked him, and he was slated to command a carrier battle group until Zumwalt took over and then sent Iceland to, you know, exile him. So, I mean, so why was he promoted? Because he was probably liked. He probably, and there is that relationship. They didn't want him, the good boy to get spoiled. Mm -hmm. Now, my real question are, issue is with respect to the torpedo thing and i think what you're running into is and i'm dealing ui ux design at the paramount is what's known as the up in affordance problem right uh what if you can point to the design oh the design looks great it must be operator error the problem is is that you have a wide difference between what's technically looks good and what's good for the operator to use, right? right? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. so I think that's where you're running into your, or why they were, because it's very easy to blame the operator of the system than actually look at whether or not the design is actually usable in a real way by. In in this case, former E4 technician me, who actually has to push the button. Okay. Okay. Uh, did you want to take? No, no, okay. No. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I'm over on the left because I've done the right fairly heavily now. Yes. <laughs> in the back, there, and then and then. Just want to make an observation. However argumentative these people were with each other, almost everybody you mentioned today had a ship named after them. Was the chief of staff of the Saint Paul, and I just I, that probably didn't get the name because of the mask. Lynn McCormick, is it? Oh, oh that's oh, no, 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 he, he didn't last very long. No, he, didn't last very long. <laughs> he was replaced by Spruance, and Nimitz had made that decision quite early. He went off, became a naval district commander, and commanded a desk. Um, the yeah. staff officers that you mentioned that Nimitz kept all, all have ships named after them. Um, um, as, as, as a recovering person working for uh, someone recovering from the process of navy ship naming um with my with my successor who will who has inherited that role uh, at the other end of the table um, uh, uh let's not talk about ship naming yet. <laughs> but thank you yeah. all right hunter and then i think norman had a question yeah. no, no, no hunter first then norman please thank yeah. you mm -hmm. um what a, what a terrific panel. Thank you. Um, two quick questions on uh, the Torpedo Factory and then one on, uh, on Nimitz. Um, mm -hmm. So on Torpedo Factory, um, 
first, I was curious if either of you encountered in your research or could, you know, offer your thoughts as to the potential effect of the labor dispute that Tommy Hart gets into in, you know, before the U.S. involvement in World War One, beyond the tip with FDR that ends up, you know, leads, leads to FDR defixing his nomination to the head of, you know, to be Sinkus, says about the Asiatic fleet. Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of inspired by Frank's comments about the potential New England manufacturing culture of the Scorpio factory. I'm curious if your thoughts there. Um, Frank, you mentioned in terms of the sourcing. Um, I imagine you've seen James Five Oral History, which I think is that it's either Columbia or USNI. I think it might be Columbia. Um, he certainly talks about the more And then Trent, I was curious, um, considering that, you know, as you well know, in terms of the development of the interwar doctrine and Fort Warren, how the Navy never seemed to really get a sense of how do we actually do war termination in Plan Orange. It sort of becomes the dog that caught the car. Yeah. Um, absent the bombs, absent an accident invasion, what, what is your perception as to Nimitz's thinking as to how we actually conduct war termination short of you know, nuclear nuclear escalation or you know, amphibious invasion? Okay. Frank, do you want to talk about uh, labor, labor in the uh, I have a very succinct answer. I have not done enough research into that yet to provide a sufficient answer to your questions. <laughs> I've not, I've not addressed it either, uh, I'm afraid, sorry. sorry. Okay. Trent? Ah, okay, yeah, um, I forget exactly which panel it was, Hunter, maybe you were there also, but we talked about this a little bit yesterday. And yeah, the, um, what I thought was quite interesting was the, the theory that the, the Navy never really thought about it. It was like, well, we will impose blockade, and then I think the, the way the speaker put it, then the Japanese will see sense, and they will spread it. Uh, <laughs> and um, obviously, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an excellent example, which is what uh, that speaker is making. I'm sorry, I can't remember the person's name. Is is that um, organizations, uh, militaries, or nations come to these things with very different perspectives? And there's a great challenge in that uh, if you aren't able to sufficiently understand the perspective of an opponent, it can be very difficult to figure out how to trigger victory or success, uh, whatever you want to call it. And so I think we can see that in the Navy's work in the interwar period. And I think from what I've been gathering from what Nimitz is interested in, right? So he, he doesn't want to invade, he has alternative uh, operations, and they're all about commercial strangulation. Right, so there is Operation Starvation, which is you know the the B twenty nine for a bunch of mines, um, really curtail Japanese movements of uh, intercoastal shipping. Um, Halsey, in one of the late war carrier raids, destroys uh, railroad ferries that can bring coal to Honshu, and so I think Nimitz's emphasis is on well we will prevent them from having any kind of a modern industrial economy, and we will cut off their food sources, and then we will see what happens. Thank you. Norman Friedman. Well, to what uh, Trent just said, do you think anyone thought seriously about war termination more recently? <laughs> Nobody has talked about whether the Soviet Union ever talked about why they should fall. There's still a whole lot of them. And then somehow the, the birds would come out. People would say, oh, isn't it nice that we stop blowing each other up? It will be nice. If you spent any virtue would think like that, you know, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> uh, the other comment I'd make is that I don't think that the failure to test torpedoes sufficiently is all that we need. I think that pre war navies in general, not just US, certainly British, mm -hmm. didn't test things very much. Period. End of story. Look, I don't know how many of you were at the, the war gaming thing the other day, but remember the business that, that uh, Allison pointed out about the British uh, series of concentration fire? Yep. Does it occur to you they never worked it much? And that if they had, they would have noticed that the radios might not might have known what they were doing. A lot of it stuck in, well, everything's going to work, of course. You see that if when they, they, they had this marvelous idea of situational awareness, but it required proper communication, and then it turns out no one has ever heard about what they're supposed to do. 
an awful lot of the culture of testing that you know of that we do has to do with, oh my God, it didn't work. <laughs> if you look at, at torpedoes as an example, you know, they're, 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 they're nasty. The other thing that's very striking to me is that I have always heard that the political relationship between Rhode Island uh, Democrats, and that's, I'm not being fair, Rhode Island representatives, and the torpedo station preserved them from questions. And by the way, made it real hard for anybody to buy, buy torpedoes from anywhere else. And it's very striking to me that that has not come up in this discussion, which so makes me think it's a little wet. Mm -hmm. Uh, just for the uh, online audience, there was a, uh, Norman Friedman just made the point uh, laterally of uh, the, uh, the relationship of the torpedo station to New Rhode Island's congressional delegation and how that might have shaped the lack of questioning of the torpedo station as an activity. And then he made some previous points about that, about war termination and the inadequacy of most people's understanding of how wars end in advance of those conflicts. I think we have time for one last con con uh, question. Um, Richard, Richard, yeah. or Christopher, I'm sorry, Christopher. Yeah, um, this relates to previous questions on the war termination by Norman Freeman. Uh, Trent, have you thought about how South Korea was safe? General Wiedemeyer, who's alert while General MacArthur's arranging the seating arrangements for the surrender on Missouri, recognizes that August Storm Marshal Vasilevsky's army group tearing through an masterpiece campaign in Manchuria and North Korea that we're going to lose South Korea if we don't send troops there. He begs Admiral Nimitz to sea lift a corps there. Um, I don't know the exact details of it, but um, Nimitz says yes, or I think checks with King. The 24th Corps under General Hodge arrives just in the nick of time to preserve South Korea. And this would tie into what you're doing. There's really a wartime situation still going on. And MacArthur's headquarters, even though MacArthur was an observer of the 1904-1905 uh, Russo-Japanese War is, is busy worrying about who's going to stand where on the Missouri. And <laughs> <laughs> you, you write about this in your book. Uh, no, I, I, I don't cover that. I ended that, that with determination in Japan. But I mean, that is a wonderful point because it, it reinforces the fact that Nimitz preserves his capability to understand what's going on around him and then to take action uh, and in a way that MacArthur doesn't seem to be quite able to do. Well, it's self-serving of me to say this, but I want to have, thank you very much for your attention today. It's really been a fun session, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you.